Good evening, everyone. We'll get started. Well, thank you and welcome to this lecture sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new to us, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven masters of arts program, including two online, 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff, if you can raise your hand, as whoever is staff, at the conclusion of this event, or visit us at iwp.edu. We would like to thank all our supporters who make IWP possible and make these events and programs possible. To support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu donate. Now today, today we will be hearing from, uh, from John Blacksland and Claire Bergen, who will deliver a lecture on their book, Revealing Secrets. This event is being co-sponsored by the International Association of Intelligence Education, the DC chapter, uh, which is chaired by Marilyn Peterson, and our own student chapter here at IWP. So thank you. John um, Blacksland is a professor of international security and international studies in the Strategic and Defense Studies Center, the Carl Bell School of Asian Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University. He is a senior fellow of Higher Education Academy and a fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales. He was also formerly a military intelligence officer, head of the SDCS and director of the ANU, Southeast Asian Institute. He is the author and editor of several publications on military history, intelligence, and international security affairs. And Claire Bergen has spent 30 years in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade with a focus on national security and intelligence. She, she had postings in Warszawa, Warszawa. <laughs> Moskva, Geneva, and Washington, D.C. as the liaison officer for the Office of National Assessments, followed by postings as ambassador to Hungary, Serbia, Kosovo, Romania, North Macedonia, and Montenegro. My goodness. Subsequently, she was a visiting fellow at, the, at ANU before joining John Blacksland's history writing team. She has been awarded the Polish government's Knight Cross Medal, congratulations, and the Beno Merito Medal from the foreign Polish minister. With that, please welcome our guests. And um, Ambassador, will you be speaking first? Um, yes, yes. OK, welcome. Thank you. Well, good evening and thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, for, for you future national security leaders in the room, we hope that our book, Re Revealing Secrets, will offer some insights which may be valuable in your studies and later, later on in your careers. Um, visiting, Can visi visiting Canberra in 1992, former President George H.W. Bush said, we fought wars together and together kept the peace. That makes for the ties that bind. That is quite an extraordinary thing to have said, and I would suggest that our book provides a key as to why he would have used those words. When most people think of the relationship between the United States and Australia today, they tend to think maybe of the 1951 ANZUS Alliance and the AUKUS Agreement, the trilateral security partnership between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Deeper information and technology sharing, in fact, the sharing of intellectual capital, 
which has a multiplier effect, are among the reasons why AUKUS makes sense. Important as these agreements are, I, I hope our book may persuade you that there is an even more fundamental but less understood international agreement to which Australia and the United States are parties. Namely, the UK-USA Signals Intelligence or SIGINT Network Agreement, now known as the Five Eyes, which dates back to the end of the Second World War. President Bush would have had this agreement in mind when he said those words. I'll return to this a little later. Our book actually goes right back to the very beginning of Signals Intelligence, um, even briefly to the origins of coded messages. Uh, which are as old as history itself. We argue in our book, Revealing Secrets, that it, that it isn't possible to have a deep or accurate understanding of some of the turning points in history or of the political importance of cyber security today without an understanding of signals intelligence. You, you would all know, although only a very select few knew at the time, that one of the reasons the United States entered World War I at the end of 1917 was the decryption by Nigel de Grey, an old Etonian British code breaker and SIGINT historian, of a telegram from the German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman to the Mexican Embassy in Washington. Zimmerman was seeking Mexico's help to keep the American army busy on the Mexican border in exchange for the return to Mexico of the territory of New Mexico and Texas after the war. The British were, of course, determined to conceal from the Germans the fact that they could read their telegrams. It was an, in an early example of source protection, the British made up a story about the decrypt being retrieved from a waste paper bin in the German embassy in Mexico City. But apparently that was enough. So the Zimmerman telegram was not only one of the many examples of how signals in intelligence changed the course of history, it also shows how its role, which depended on secrecy for success, was fiercely protected by SIGINT practitioners. So um, mathematical ability um, and, and this kind of educational background is widespread among Signals, signals, practitioners, especially code breakers, music is another, as well as the ability to discern patterns in speech. Eric Nave, Australia's world famous code breaker, was also a gifted Japanese linguist and an expert on Japan, which undoubtedly informed and helped his cryptography. Early on in his career, his decoding of one long telegram revealed why Japan was satisfied with the Washington Naval Treaty Ratio of, one, of, of three against five for the United States, but insisted on maintaining that, ratio, that ratio. Japan's plan that was when the American fleet set off to war across the Pacific, the ships would be harassed by the Japanese submarines along the way, suffering some losses. And by the time the ships reached the Western Pacific, they would be short of fuel, the crews would be exhausted, so the Japanese could be satisfied with their three to five. This message at the time created a sensation and was recognised as an invaluable insight into Japanese military strategic thinking. So actually, the point here is that code breakers, like great national security leaders, don't suddenly emerge in a background, sort of in a, in a vacuum. Education is the key, and there's more than one kind of education that produces outstanding results. Professor Dale Trendle was another of Australia's leading code breakers in World War II. He had an international reputation as a classical scholar uh, and was an expert on 4th century Greek vases. On the basis of features of some Sicilian and other South Italian vases, which couldn't be attributed to the influences of other regions or other schools, he somehow worked out that there must be in the region a whole undiscovered school of vase painting and that this school would have certain characteristics which he described. Needless to say, a few years later, such a school of vase painting was discovered, corresponding very closely to what Trendle had predicted. He was a natural code breaker, but he himself couldn't explain to anyone else how he did it, which must have been very annoying, 
except to say, oh, you just get a feeling for it. He seems to have been an intuitive genius. So very different minds, highly different and differently educated people all making a vital contribution. As most, most of you here today as students or teachers, you will understand that it would be hard to overstate the importance of the right teachers in producing outstanding code breakers. Um, in addition to Sydney University, the teaching at schools in Sydney, particularly Canterbury Boys High School, also attended by former Prime Minister John Howard, North Sydney Boys High School and Sydney Girls High School made a disproportionate contribution to Australia's pool of talent. Florence Violet McKenzie won a scholarship to Sydney Girls High School in 1904. She qualified as a math teacher, then studied maths and science at Sydney University before becoming the first woman in Australia to enrol in an engineering course. She anticipated the wartime need for signalers and opened a school to train girls in Morse code and radio. Thanks to her, there were women in all three services and they were high performers. As a teacher, Mrs. Mrs. Mack, as she was known, was a stickler for mastering one step completely before going on to the next. She also <coughs> used music in her teaching. And as one of her students put it, all of a sudden, a moment came when you just heard the musical sound of each letter. A certain J.W. Gibbs, the classics master at North Sydney Boys High School, was not only an excellent teacher, but encouraged his students and used his connections to help them join Australia's wartime code-breaking organisation. Our book also recounts how Herbert Yardley, a cryptanalyst with a genius for organisation established the United States' first permanent, as he thought at the time, cryptological organisation known as the Black Chamber. And we also trace the, co the code-breaking exploits of William and Elizabeth Smith Friedman, uh, the most famous pair of cryptologists, I think, in your history. Meanwhile, in Australia, in World War I, the Australian Army became renowned for a particular talent, the Anzac Squadron's unskilled wireless operators in Mesopotamia taught themselves to intercept Turkish wireless communications. This was what we call traffic analysis, the crucial tactical level of intelligence um, that revealed, for example, the location of the enemy force, the volume of messages and the level at which those messages had been sent. Um, this meant that analysts could tell when a crisis was coming um, or an attack was imminent without reading the actual message. These Australians hadn't yet had the luxury of training in cryptography because it was handled by Britain, but they recognised its value. So at this point, let's return to the Five Eyes and President Bush's ties that bind. A major reason for Australia's membership was the integrated Australia-United States wartime cooperation at General Douglas MacArthur's headquarters in Australia. The UK USA or Five Eyes has been the foundation for other agreements such as those on Australia's Northwest Cape Communications Station and the joint facilities at Pine Gap in Central Australia. But as discussed in our book, Revealing Secrets, after the Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor, Malaya and the Philippines, MacArthur was ordered to leave his headquarters in Manila Bay for Australia where he was charged with defending us and preparing a counterattack against Japan. He arrived in Melbourne on the, on the 20, 21st of March 1942 without a dedicated SIGINT unit. Central Bureau was formed for this purpose in Melbourne and Australian, British and American personnel worked together, first in Melbourne, then in Brisbane. Meanwhile, the joint Australian American Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne, or FRUMEL, supported the US Navy's 7th Fleet. The work of these Australian and American women and men of Central Bureau and FRUMEL contributed a great deal to the Allied forces' victory in the Pacific. They cracked Japanese air, Army and Air Force codes and broke into enemy diplomatic communications, playing a vital role in the battles of Coral Sea Midway, Mil Milne Bay and others. 
Based on Fumel's records, I'm going to give you a brief account from a Melbourne, Australia perspective of the lead up to the victory at Midway, which may be a little different from the one you've heard. Forewarning of the Japanese attack and crucially, and crucially the target were key to that victory. On the 14th of May, 1942, Frumel reported that Ad Admiral Yamamoto, um, who was behind the 7th of December, 1941, attack on Pearl Harbor and commander in chief of the Japanese combined fleets had informed the 4th Fleet that bombs and ammunition for the forthcoming campaign would be supplied. At this stage, the target of the attack was still unknown to the Allies, as the Japanese were using place designator AF to disguise it. But it is clear from the records that Fumel believed that it was going to be midway. Fleet radio unit Pacific analysts in Hawaii then laid a trap for the Japanese by telephoning the Midway garrison on a secure line and asking them to radio in clear, that is on an open line, for water. The target was confirmed beyond all doubt on the 21st of May when Frumel reported that Naval Intelligence to Tokyo states Midway informed Pearl Harbor that they only had enough water for two weeks and asked for an immediate resupply. Frumel was also involved in the interception of the flight plans of Admiral Yamamoto. From a variety of, rec of collection sites, SIGINT provided the time and place Admiral Yamamoto's plane would be transiting and as a result it was shot down and he was killed. There is some debate about who deserved the most credit for this. Australian sources claim that the Royal Australian Air Force's Townsville unit uh, intercepted messages about Yamamoto's itinerary. According to other accounts, an American monitoring unit intercepted messages about the flight on the 14th of April, but the, the decryptions were incomplete. What we know for sure is that there was confirmed interception of just two signals containing the Admiral's itinerary and some important confirming details. <coughs> and both of these reportedly came from Frumil in Melbourne. It seems to have been an outstanding example of seamless cooperation between Frupac and Frumil. These are reminders that wars are also won by force of thought, and this is perhaps most clearly illustrated by the role of signals intelligence, and the human factor is just as central to cyber security today as it was to SIGINT in earlier wars. As the Second World War ended, the Cold War, of course, adorned, and it, it was you know, Australia defined it as the continuing worldwide struggle between communism and the free world waged by all means short of international armed conflict. This had special meaning for signals intelligence because China and the former Soviet Union, the communist powers, provided training in signals intelligence, including cryptography, to their fellow communists in Korea and Vietnam. Australia, like the United States and the United Kingdom, was indeed a participant in the, travel, in the struggle against communism, but our situation was complicated by the fact that the wars into which we were drawn um, were in our own neighbourhood. Because of our geography, our interests might, all, might not always have been identical to those of the United States or the United Kingdom, but that same geography offered and still offers our allies advantages. Um, in the Second World War, the, the vagaries of high-frequency communications meant that enemy messages intercepted in Australia were unobtainable from sites in Great Britain and North America. For example, one World War II message from the Japanese minister in Stockholm to the foreign ministry in Tokyo was intercepted by the Australian Army Special Wireless Group in Bonagilla near Albury in Victoria in Australia. Um, reporting on an unsuccessful coup against Hitler by an elite German army group um, who wanted peace with Russia. <coughs> Details of the breakthrough are closely held, but it, it appears again that because of these high frequency communications, atmospheric effects, the top secret program codenamed Venona, run by the US Army's Signals Intelligence Service, first came on stream, meaning it could be reliably collected at the Australian base Coonawarra near Darwin in late 1944. SIGINT thus became the DNA or like the genetic code of the Cold War experience. Um, 
1950, Korea had not been an intelligence priority for the United States, and the effect of Soviet SIGINT training on communist signals intelligence in Northeast Asia was, was very clear. In mid-1951, all access to enemy communications was lost when the Soviet-trained North Koreans changed all their codes and ciphers to the unbreakable one-time pad cipher systems. So for the last two years of the war, the United States and its allies had to rely on low-level voice intercept and traffic analysis for insights on enemy capabilities and plans. The job of the Australians was mainly own course communications then, but we can tell from correspondence that they also took the opportunity to intercept enemy, com uh, enemy communications whenever they could. Uh, so apart from learning at first hand the, va the value of high level SIGINT from the lack of it, Australia was on the spot at a historic turning point when the United States changed course completely from disarmament in order to stop Soviet expansion. Australia's participation in the Vietnam War was also with the encouragement of the United States. Um, when our forces first deployed in 1962, SIGINT was still little known. Um, Australia's DSD organisation hid its functions behind its title like NSA's, which I believe has been jokingly called no such agency. And Australia's SIGINT and electronic warfare functions remain concealed. But we sent to Vietnam a formation with a full complement of arms and services, including two specialist signals intelligence units, the 1st Divisional Intelligence Unit and 547 Signal Troop, which accompanied the 1st Australian Task Force in 1966. Raised specifically for Vietnam, 547 Signal Troop included men with over 20 years' experience of SIGINT, including tours of duties overseas who were, they were very highly regarded by other nations and considered to be very professional, which was a good thing as the North, their North Vietnamese opponents had been trained by the Soviets. One of the most important contributions of SIGINT to the Australian Land Force campaign was soon after the first Australian task force arrived in May 1966. Just as it was establishing itself in and around a small <coughs> hill known as Nui Dat or Dirt Hill, the Viet Cong had hoped for an early victory against the newly arrived Australians. The battle that followed at Long Tan, about five kilometres east of Nui Dat, upset that plan. Cut off and outnumbered by at least 10 to 1, the Australians fought against the, two, uh, the 275th Viet Cong Regiment and won. SIGINT had a role in this remarkable victory, but it was not as important as it should have been. 547 Troop had reported the signs of increased enemy activity at least three weeks before the battle. But due to the secrecy surrounding SIGINT, although a limited version was passed to infantry battalion commanders, they weren't told its source, and they discounted it because their patrols found no signs of enemy activity. After the Battle of Long Tan, though, Australian and Allied staff officers began to pay much more attention to SIGINT. Meanwhile, trained by the Chinese and then the Soviets, the Vietnamese had used several different cryptographic systems during the course of the war. They, 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 um, they also used their own techniques, you know, making, making, their, making their messages more difficult even to decipher. Um, they... Yeah, by the end of the war, they were using a double encryption system involving the use of substitution codes from a code book and then enciphering the coded message using a one-time pad. As a result, despite, despite the far greater techn technological resources of their opponents, particularly Americans, mm -hmm. the North Vietnamese communications intelligence specialists had quite some success in both protecting their own communications and, inquiring and acquiring secrets from their opponents. Our book, Revealing Secrets, compares the Vietnam and Second World War experiences. During the Second World War, code breaking of the Enigma, Lawrence and Purple machines uncovered the plans of Axis forces, enabling allies to counterattack and develop effective strategies against them. In the Vietnam War, however, the inability to read high-level codes left SIGINT units and agencies 
drowning really in tactical communications which were easier to decipher, but the effect would have been like not being able to see the wood for the trees. As Australia, as Australia moved from forward defence in the 70s towards the defence of Australia and greater self-reliance and focus on our own region, we didn't neglect our alliance relationships. We joined the coalition led by the United States in the Gulf War against Iraq. Uh, the joint facilities at Narangar, as part of the defence support program, detected the launch of Iraqi Scud missiles and provided warning to coalition forces and to civilian populations in Israel and Saudi Arabia. In the age of the Asian century, Australia remains a suitable piece of real estate for allied intelligence. Later, Australians joined the coalitions led by the United States in Afghanistan and in the 2003 war against Iraq. The nature of SIGINT makes it a vital hidden current of continuity, which in the case of the Five Eyes partners is reinforced by a common language as well as shared values and wartime experiences and bonds which are simply irreplaceable. These are, to quote President Bush, the, the ties that bind. Looking to the future, education is an important way to strengthen those ties. I mentioned at the beginning uh, the multiplier effect of the sharing of intellectual capital, as well as the importance of cognitive diversity in the field of nat national security. Australia and the United States each have the advantage of mega diverse societies. We also share these values, wartime experience, and the common language. It seems to us that the groundwork is there for deeper cooperation in education on national security matters. And uh, we hope we'll have an opportunity to discuss this more later. And we also hope you'll all read our book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, really a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Uh, I'm a tired act to follow Claire. Uh, the oh. professor, professional ambassador and practitioner that she is. Um, I'm going to give it a, sh give it a shot. Uh, um, and um, talk through some of the pictures and uh, the, the narratives behind some of the stories that are in the book that I'm hoping uh, yeah. you'll pick up. Um, and uh, what we find is, what we've gone is, we've woven some of the uh, older history of uh, Western cryptography going back through the British line and the American line and then try to make sense of that and bring that together in the Australian context. And of course, one of the famous stories is of Sir Francis Walsingham, who breaks the code of uh, Queen Mary Souter, who is passing information that is actually treasonous about the overthrow of Queen Elizabeth. Um, and that decryption, that a, a simple monoalphabetic substitution cipher um, was uh, involved that Sir Francis Walsingham unpicked um, this idea of substitution ciphers, is, of course, it's one that features in the stories subsequently as well. The idea of a polyalphabetic substitution is where you have a, on a wheel, say, all the numbers and letters of an alphabet, and then you have more than one, so you have poly substitution. So one wheel, a second wheel, perhaps even a third or more. And, of course, where do we find that but in the World War II Enigma machine, of course. So this idea of substitution of alphabetic substitution goes right back in fact goes back to ancient times and we talk about that in the book uh, Claire mentioned uh, signalman John Varco and his exploits in in the First World War his memory uh, the the cenotaph uh, uh, in Martin Place in downtown Sydney the statue is of this this man actually uh, uh, now of course what happened along the way in the First World War early on German raiders were operating in the Indian Ocean um, and uh, HMAS Sydney picked up signs of uh, German SMS Emden communications uh, and they were then vectored onto that ship and they encountered it and the SMS Emden was outgunned and there it is, as I say, beached and done for at Christmas Island, a Cocos Island in the Indian Ocean, Australian Territory in the Indian Ocean. Um, the Battle of Jutland, very interesting to see naval uh, intelligence, naval cryptography at work. A lot of uh, people didn't quite understand its application um, and uh, the British Admiralty struggled with understanding, reading 
what the signs were of if the German main uh, signal station was still ashore, uh, it seemed that the, maybe the fleet hadn't left. And of course, that was always the pattern. They left the main signals uh, station ashore and they deployed with a, with a deployable version. So uh, the British fleet sailed out to the Battle of Jutland, not, antis not anticipating the full German fleet being there, even though had they listened to their SIGINT operators, they would have known that. But they dismissed them as being irrelevant. Um, in Australia's case, we have some really interesting uh, figures who play a prominent role in launching Australian cryptography. Uh, we have uh, Commander Rupert Long, who forms the, the Royal Australian Navy's uh, signals and intelligence apparatus, and then Lieutenant General E.K. Squires, who's actually a British officer seconded to the Australians uh, early on in the Second World War. He really is adamant about the need for a SIGINT organisation and convinces the Australian government that they should do that and get ready for what's coming. And that's indeed the case. And of course, what are we facing? As I say, polyalphabetic substitution. Here is an Enigma, World War II German Enigma machine. Um, this is a fairly simple one. It's got the three rotor wheels. It's got the plug board at the back, so you can seal the plug, so you can swap and complicate the message. But over time, they went from three rotors to four rotors to five, uh, as they increasingly worried that maybe, you know, a smart, uh, similar perhaps, uh, you know, poly sub uh, alphabetic substitution machine could reverse engineer the code. Of course, that was what was exactly what was going on. Um, uh, and this is thanks to three Polish cryptographers who in the 1930s had uh, studied the German Enigma machine, had worked out the bomber machine that they had to basically, through number crunching, work through the possible permutations that the German Enigma machine must have been using to then uh, work out the codes. That knowledge, those insights, was passed on to the Brits. Uh, Alan Turing then developed his own bomb machine in, at, uh, at uh, GCNCS, Government Code and Cipher School, at Bletchley Park uh, in the UK. And uh, they then used that. Interestingly enough, they start with, initially it wasn't very successful, but when they started with some threads, so the obvious, like the, the, the salutations that you could expect to be at the start of a message or, and, the, and the greetings at the, at the end, uh, you could actually, with a bit of pattern analysis, work out what was the thread. And then you could, having started unpicking the thread, it then helped pull the whole seam apart. So it's really clever uh, thinking through of, of, uh, of, of, the, of the permutations involved. Um, and of course, that's influencing what's happening in Australia, most effectively by the work of Abe Sinkoff. Abe Sinkoff, who's a very significant uh, US SIGINT officer, uh, who is involved in the, uh, signing some of the secret deals behind the Atlantic Charter, uh, leading up to the outbreak of war in, uh, in, in December 1941. He is sent to Australia to help uh, meld Australian and US SIGINT uh, me mechanisms for the war in the Pacific. Uh, on the right is Eric Nave that uh, Claire mentioned. Eric Nave is this uh, polyglot, incredible polymath. He's a Japanese linguist. He breaks the JN25 Japanese Naval Code. Um, and he is influential throughout the war in helping the Allies to stay abreast with each permutation of the, German, of the Japanese codes as they kept updating them and revising them and republishing them. He was just one step behind them, uh, very, very closely following and making a significant contribution to what was going on there. Helped by Mrs Mack that Claire talked about, Mrs Violet, uh, Florence Violet McKenzie, who was instrumental in training a whole cohort of women who would go on to play really prominent roles behind the scenes. And of course, we're trying to give them a little bit of credit now because they weren't given the credit back in the day. Uh, back the, they would, many of them went to their graves, not uh, acknowledging in public the incredible work that they had done in wartime because they were sworn to secrecy. Um, and, and there were many of them actually working at Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne, Frommel, uh, D Special Section, the Diplomatic Special Section that was working on on the, the diplomatic cables and un, uh, decrypting them, as well as Central Bureau, which was MacArthur's combined Australian-American headquarters for signals intelligence, um, and so on. Um, this is actually the code room in Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne. It's actually the photo we've got on the cover of the book. Uh, and you can see there's not very men there. It's all women. Uh, the incredible uh, 
uh, intellectual power of these women that was finally recognised in this instance. And being International Women's Week, it's appropriate that we, that we, we feature them here uh, in this instance. Um, and of course, in Central Bureau, it started in Melbourne and then as MacArthur moved his headquarters to Brisbane and up, so it relocated to Brisbane. Um, and there you see a variety of uniforms from the services that are collaborating together in Central Bureau. Here's some of the figures uh, in Australian SIGINT uh, of the Second World War. Booth on the left, Sanford in the middle, quite a character, and uh, Trawick on the right. Trawick on the right is uh, a, he's a, 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 a classicist who teaches himself Japanese, and as the war comes along, he gets taken out of Sydney University, sent down to Melbourne. His granddaughter uh, is now a colleague of mine, Professor Anthea Roberts, at the Australian National University. Whip smart. I mean, seriously smart lady. Um, and uh, great colleague. Uh, and with, she's uh, done some really fantastic groundbreaking research. Um, uh, yeah, echoing the great mind of her grandfather. It's, it's really exciting. Uh, and she came to along to our first book talk in Canberra. Uh, last year. Um, but technology is a big part of the equation. We see these machines, uh, the, 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 the teletype, this is the uh, allied equivalent of the Enigma. Essentially same kind of thing. Uh, it's uh, polyalphabetic substitution, rotor machines, rotor wheels that are being used to, to punch out encryption, encrypted messages that are then transmitted over the radio waves across the Atlantic or across the Pacific. Uh, to from MacArthur back to Nimitz or back to uh, he, uh, uh, the headquarters back here at the Pentagon in, 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 in Washington. Uh, Sig Sally was an encrypted voice communication system. Clearly it's a honking big machine, so not very portable. So there weren't very many of them, but MacArthur had one in, in Brisbane, there was one in Hawaii, there's one in Washington, and there's one in London. So these really significant pieces of technology, so Churchill could talk to Roosevelt and, and, and the like. Um, the Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, Claire touched on this. The Battle of the Coral Sea, people forget, in fact, the Japanese had intended to invade Port Moresby on the southern coast of New Guinea, uh, and the Battle of the Coral Sea disrupted that plan. So while it was it evoked significant damage to US naval vessels, including the USS Lexington and others, it nonetheless disrupted, it was a significant strategic victory because it disrupted Japanese plans. Um, and, of course, Australia's in the thick, in the mix of that as well, providing some of the SIGINT support, much like, as Claire said, with the Battle of Midway as well, where we are working collaboratively from Melbourne down under, uh, from Hawaii, through Pak, through Mel, collaboratively actually coming up with more than the sum of the parts. Right? This is what's really interesting about the networked SIGINT architecture of the Second World War that makes an incredible difference. So the... the uh, the Japanese ambush that was supposed to happen at, at, at Midway is in fact inverted and it becomes an ambush of the Japanese as they try to set their own ambush. An incredible turning point, the major inflection point of course, after this point we don't see Japan embarking on offensive, large scale offensive operations because they just don't have it anymore. The fleet's been, it's in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Going to the Vietnam War, we'd skip over the, the Korean War, but um, we, we could dwell on this all night, really. We'd tease it out, but I just wanted to dwell on a couple of things. This is uh, an Australian airborne radio direction finder that was flown over the battlefields as pictured in the right there. That is a signal station being set up on a hill in South Vietnam somewhere. Um, and you can see the helicopters bringing in the containers for the communications kit and the, and the radio relay microwave antennas there that are being used for communications. This bit is informing the radio, airborne radio direction finder is actually locating by going on a straight line and then listening at different angles to get the bearing on a radio emanation from the, the Viet Cong. And that would then be used to steer the troops on the ground onto the target and they would then prosecute the target. Um, very significant. It's a, it was an Australian innovation. There are more technical, capable ones that the Americans, uh, the US Army and US Air Force operated. But these ones were in the back of a Cessna, so they were quite innocuous. They didn't look like they had bulb, big bulbs hanging off them that made them obviously, you know, uh, SIGINT uh, platforms. Um, uh, the Navy also has a significant uh, SIGINT element. Uh, 
Uh, so it's not just the National Seeking Agency, the Royal Australian Navy Tactical Electronic Warfare Support Squadron, uh, or RANCHUS, um, operate, has operated with uh, um, aircraft and on, on ships for going back uh, to the Second World War, if not before. And of course, uh, this picture on the right there is this guy, James Armstrong, who's a, who was a Royal Navy transferee to the Australian Navy. Um, he, he, was, he, he, he had a certain je ne sais quoi, if you like. He, he had a bit of, uh, a, he was quite a demonair fellow. And he, he, was, he was prominent at the time of the Moonraker, a James Bond movie, right? And uh, so people really thought this guy was, you know, the, the bee's knees. Uh, anyway, he was in crack, quite a di human dynamo in terms of di really reinvigorating the tactical electronic warfare support for the Royal Australian Navy, uh, which is now as, as bad a, as robust as you can get. Um, of course, we have encrypted uh, and digital communications. On the left, there's a Stu 2, which we'll know and love from the good old days. Um, and on the right is a Telstra Speakeasy, which is an Australian version of which I used to use and Claire and I used to use back in the day, um, an Australian uh, encrypted voice communication so you could call somebody and be confident that it was reasonably secure. Um, so that kind of technological innovation played a big role. Um, with this on the left is a deployed, deployable SIGIN support facility or DSSF as we call it. And on the right is the first Cray computer that we had in Australia. Of course, the supercomputer, the Cray supercomputer, taken over by Hewlett Packard Enterprises, the Cray CP HPE now. Um, but this is, this is at the, the, the cusp of the, of the digital revolution. This is, when we see, this is when we see a Copernican revolution take place in terms of signals intelligence. So you have these agencies like No Such Agency or the Australian the Defence Signals Bureau, this isn't AT&T, folks, right? It's not there to help you with your service. It's eavesdropping, right? It's listening, right? Okay? So it's mis the mislabeling of these organisations deliberately to deflect attention from their real purpose, right? So uh, what we see is with the digital revolution, all of a sudden the cyber world requires these agencies that are the half of computing excellence in the nation They've gone from being electromechanical computers to digital computers, but nonetheless, that's where the expertise lies. That's where the people who, who know how to reveal others' secrets and protect our own, their expertise is drawn upon to form, in Australia's case, the Australian Cyber Security Centre, right? A national body to help the states, to help industries, schools, universities, society writ large to protect against the incessant and industrial scale cyber attacks that we all know and hate. <laughs> um, anyway, this is what happens inside the Australian Signals Directorate. So this body that's full of hoodie wearing, basement dwelling, introverted, nerdy geeks who only play with ones and zeros and don't socialise very much, right? Um, they are all of a sudden shunted to the front and given this mandate to go and speak to society and engage, put themselves out there, put up the essential eight, generate a website, speak to the, the nation, to the world, to each other. And of course, this is happening in the US, it's happening in Canada, the UK and New Zealand and, Australia, and other countries as well with like-minded who are swapping notes on the need to actually toughen up, be more resilient in the face of a world that's gone from being web enabled to web dependent, and of course, in turn, web vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable. And so being resilient in that context is proving more and more challenging and the role of the SIGINT domain is more, 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 more pertinent than ever. Interesting, of course, when, when we were going from the analogue to the digital revolution, I remember I was a signals troop commander, I actually satellite terminal troop commander uh, back in the, in the, in the 1980s, uh, which is revealing my age, I'm sorry to say. But, um, and... Um, one of my colleagues who was an electrical engineer said, John, a revolution is coming. It's the digital revolution. I said, oh, come on, mate, what are you talking about? He said, no, it's going to be ones and zeros. Everything is going to be ones and zeros. And I thought, come on, that's ridiculous, right? But he was right. He was right. It, we were on the cusp of it. This is before the internet, late 1980s. Uh, and, of course, only a few years later, we're all, we're all dealing with, with the World Wide Web, uh, with ones and zeros, and, of course, the, the pivotal role of our national SIGINT authorities to helping us protect ourselves from incessant attack. Now, this, this is one of my favourite photos. You know, Claire talked about um, the suitable piece of real estate. 
Um, I, we mention also um, in the Second World War that um, submarines were based in Western Australia, a place called Fremantle or Cockburn Sound, um, just south of Fremantle. At the height of the Second World War, they had 170 submarines operating from there, right? 170 submarines able to deploy up to the, 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 the straits of Southeast Asia, the Sunda, Lombok, Waita and Malacca Straits and interdict Japanese shipping and speed up, accelerate the defeat of the, of the enemy. Um, that space um, is back in vogue. Fremantle is the site of the, uh, of the AUKUS deal. The fleet rotational, uh, so, uh, submarine force, rotational force west, that's going to see uh, nuclear propulsion submarines based out of uh, Western Australia is going to be where they did it back in World War II, right? That geography is still the same. It's incredibly useful. It's consequential. It's the same. But now, of course, in the in the digital era, where satellites and global communications are more consequential than ever, uh, there's another suitable piece of real estate, which is Pine Gap, the Joint Defence Facility in the middle of Australia. That place, if you ever get a chance to go, it is mind blowing. Right? It is awesome. Some of you may have been there. If you haven't, angle to get there one day. It's so cool. It's really very cool. Um, uh, but it's incredibly potent, very, very significant. Uh, shared joint defence facility. So it's operated by Australians and Americans, the only one of its kind in the world, where we actually over trusted, the trusted collaboration that's built over generations, going back to the days of MacArthur and, and, and Abe Sinkoff, um, that has enable this space to, to be occupied by the kind of collaborative mechanisms we have in place today between Australia and the United States, which is leading to where we are today with the Red Spice program, where we're looking to expand significantly uh, Australia's SIGINT and um, cyber capabilities to muscle up, to help society be more resilient, uh, to tapping into that wealth of expertise in the SIGINT domain. So you have, for instance, someone like Mike Burgess, who goes from being a senior executive in uh, the Defence Signals Directorate, goes to our, uh, like at and a body called Telstra, a company, a phone service provider, and the internet as well. He goes there to help them set up their, their cyber security program. So he lives there for five years, thinking that that's where he's gonna be, and then they, you know, they can't, they, I think I get away, and then they keep calling me back, right? He gets drawn back in, drawn back in, to the program, he gets to be made director of DSD, ASD as it became, the Australian Signals Directorate. He then went on to become the, the Director General of Australia's Security Intelligence Organisation, kind of FBI-like body, ASIO. Um, but essentially, what we're seeing is this, uh, this, the consequence of understanding what happened in the SIGINT domain. It's more than just about the SIGINT domain. And what I argue is that, in fact, if you want to understand inter international relations fully, you can't do it if you don't understand the place of SIGINT. All right, now I am, I've got you here under false pretenses because I'm actually from the Australian National University and I want you to come and study in Australia. Right? I want you, and some of you, you know, maybe a little thinking you're probably past that, but that's okay. Um, essentially, we want, to, we want Americans to come and do a term or a semester in Australia to come and experience it because we are a little bit exotic, but not too exotic. We're also a lot of fun and we have a worldview, a perspective on the world that overlaps with yours, that is sufficiently different to warrant close consideration. Right? So we have a number of opportunities. At my university, the Australian National University, we have, it's, it's a, it really is, it's a very cool place to go and study. Um, in, in downtown Canberra, which is the closest equivalent to Washington uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, a city designed by uh, an American guy from Chicago, Walter Burley Griffin. It's where, it's where all the national security agencies are, all the intel agencies are headquartered there. It's where I teach the course with Claire, Honeypots and Overcoats, Australian Intelligence in the World. It's like, how cool is that? I mean, really, can you top that? I mean, really. Um, so, and I'm in the College of Asia and the Pacific, which includes a lot of schools, public policy, national security, and my department with, where Claire and I work, the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of bodies in that space 
uh, and I live, we work in this, the ivory tower, so I literally am from an ivory tower. All right? um, so I can claim that, uh, that honorific. Um, but we do nuclear physics, we do, our, our former vice chancellor was a, or president was an astrophysics guy, um, and we do, uh, we've got this Institute for Climate Energy and Disaster Solutions and Cybernetics. What the blazes is cybernetics, you might ask, that kind of twilight zone between humans and computers, the interface between humans and computers. Pretty interesting space. Our new president and vice chancellor is a cybernetics. She set up the School of Cybernetics. So there we have it, uh, Australia's leading university by a number of measures that matter, as listed there, and I'm happy for these slides to be shared later if you're interested. Um, but essentially, you've got a lot of study options at the Australian National University and at other Australian universities as well. Um, so uh, for it, I can put to you that a semester in Australia or a course in Australia is going to accelerate and boost your uh, career prospects because you'll have insights and understanding of a close ally, but from down under, looking north at the great power challenges from a completely different angle. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for humouring me. I will conclude at that juncture. Thank you. We are going to take questions. Um, we have a solid 10 minutes, maybe 12. Um, so if you have questions, just direct them. Do we need both of our guests to stand here at the podium, or oh, we have we have that microphone for them. Okay, so maybe we should give them one. Do you want to put them in chairs right here? Let's have them sit up here. And that way we can hand you one microphone, and then we can pass the other one around. And I can and I'll so there we go. We can we can we can operate this one, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Oh, okay, we're still needing... Okay, so we'll, yeah, but this one works, right? Okay, so we just come to this one. All right, who's going to be our first question? Oh, in the back here. Uh, hi, um, I'm uh, Alex Williams, I'm from Radio Free Asia. Uh, you mentioned at the end um, the director of the Australian Signals Directorate. Um, in the last few years, he's kind of come out more publicly and made... I'm not sure I'd call them interventions, but at least uh, statements that have been kind of politically debated. Mm. Um, I'm wondering um, why you think he's done that and um, how past people in his equivalent positions would um, kind of interpret or view uh, mm. someone like him making these uh, big public speeches. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting question um, because he's not the first Director General of ASIO to go public. Uh, there's a long tradition of that going back to the 1980s and 70s. Uh, previous directors general have made, uh, gone to the National Press Club and given a big public address. Uh, the main, what, the guy who, who was the director general for most of the Cold War, a guy called Charles Spry, who's a retired brigadier from the Second World War, uh, former director of military intelligence, he was very media averse. Uh, he had done uh, some appearances at the Royal Commission on Espionage what they call the Petrov Royal Commission, when Vladimir and Evdokia Petrov defected in the mid-1950s. But he was very averse to speaking. And, and in fact, there was a huge controversy that arose from the Petrov defections and the Royal Commission of the 1950s. And that related to this issue of these people who were accused of being spying spies for Russia never went to jail. So what the hell's going on? Why, pardon the French, but why, why, why are you making these accusations and then not locking them up. And there's a similar one in the media in Australia today. Why is accusations being made against Australian politicians apparently passing secrets? When and, and why are you not putting the name out there? Why are you not prosecuting them? Well, of course, we now know back about what happened in the 1950s. The key information that was corroborating the nest of spies was the Venona, Venona decrypts. So nobody wanted to give them away, right? Nobody wanted to show their hand in public in a way that the Russians would be able to monitor that we'd broken their codes and we were tracking their spies. So that was, that was fundamentally important. So this is, as I say, in the, in the espionage business, the secret of success is in keeping your successes secret. And here we have this conundrum 
where and so and for years uh, in politics in Australia, conspiracists would say this was all a plot by the conservative Menzies government to stay in office, to you know kick the Labor Party, the left centre left party down while they're down, and to keep them out of office. Look, there's no question. There's an element of that. He was a politician. You know, he was capitalising on the opportunity. The fact was there was a nest of spies, and he felt un- constrained to. Under, on Charles Spry's advice not to divulge further detail at the Royal Commission, which would have seen them convicted because it would have also seen Venona blown. Right? Uh, so now as to what's happening today, who knows? I, I don't have privileged access anymore, but as a historian I know how things have worked in the past and invariably there's more to the story than, the, than meets the public eye. So... I, that's the only the context I can provide to what's going on now. Thanks. If I could just add, maybe maybe I could just add something to that. Be- before Mike, before do I need this? Both. Yeah. Before Mike Burgess became the um, the head of ASIO, he was the he was the director of the Australian Signals Directorate, and then also he 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 made um, he made a couple of statements about what. ASD operatives did, and, you know, giving the example of a young woman operator who managed to persuade someone not to join a terrorist group. And I, he believes that there's, there's, there should be a balance between sharing information um, and, but, not, but without betraying sources and methods. He was very careful about what he said. And I, I believe he still is. There would have been a good reason for that, possibly to give possibly to let people know that their cover was blown, but without actually betraying how they knew. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right here. Hi, Peter Rockby and the Talentless Analyst down at Quantum Diploma. Um, one of the things that I find absolutely shocking is that uh, we've seen perhaps a dozen reports about the horrible use of Uyghur people. And after 12 years, not one of those reports has been translated into Bahasa or Urdu or Arabic or any Muslim language whatsoever. And this question of language is what I want to ask you about. Um, It's pretty easy for me to imagine that some of our adversaries might go Navajo code talker on us by translating into uh, Kazakh or Mongolian. Um, And I don't see us developing those capabilities. Certainly all the Chinese geeks are learning as much English as they can. But on our side, it's so rare to find uh, Australians or Five Eyes anywhere learning obscure languages. Is this going to be solved by artificial intelligence translation of those languages? Or do we have to get serious about learning uh, tough adversarial languages? Um, I, that's, that's a very good point, but I believe that we are. You're quite right about that, and I think in Australia we're very conscious of it, and there, there are people learning obscure languages, you know, like Tetum, and you know, even more, even more obscure than the languages you're talking about. So I think there is an awareness of that. Probably not, you know, may, probably not enough, but I know that some, uh, something is being done. So there's also another thing that's been done, um, and it, it kind of echoes the what was done with the Allied translator and interpreter service in the Second World War, uh, where um, it just Japanese descendants or people with Japanese affiliation who, who speak Japanese were actually employed as the translators. Um, now Australia, much like the United States, it's really uh, very cosmopolitan. It's got people from just about every corner of the globe. Uh, we really have become, you know, in many ways quite like the United States that way. We attract people from all over the place uh, in the hundreds of thousands every year. Uh, so we now have a pool of potential recruits to work in the intelligence community and, and, and that are more diverse than ever. And in fact, quite a lot of them are now actually getting brought in to work uh, to help add to the diversity required to help cover the possibilities of being outflanked, if you like, with obscure languages. So there's quite a lot of, uh, of that happening at the moment. And several of them used to be my students. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Time for two more questions. Yeah. Now, I'm Peter Sonkula, and I just wanted to commend you uh, for this book. You know, in reading it, it is really a, a very scholarly and thorough uh, book, but I also want to point out the fact that while you're talking about signals intelligence, 
it's also very much uh, applicable to the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. and New Zealand. So mm -hmm. the Five Eyes continues, and and uh, yeah. I, I think right. that mm -hmm. they've done a great job. Thank you. Marilyn, that's very kind. Can I just add, that was one of the purposes of the book, to put actually Australian SIGINT in its international Five Eyes context uh, and weaving the stories together, the antecedents, uh, going back to the previous centuries and explaining how they come together in 1942 and then they per are perpetuated and have been for more than 80 years since then. And it, as I say, it's that trusted, deep, intergenerational con uh, collaboration that's the context in which an AUKUS arrangement can even be considered possible. How does a president of a country like the United States agree to share the crown jewels, nuclear propulsion technology, with a country so far away? Well, it's that 80 years of top secret, trusted collaboration with networks that go back generations, that's the background noise, that enables a president when presented with the proposition to say, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Thank you, Marilyn. Yeah, great question. So uh, Australia has deep and deepening ties bilaterally with Japan and with Korea. Uh, you know, if you think about the hub and spoke alliance of uh, those Australia, Japan, Korea, that they've been trusted US allies for a long time, but they've been relationships that have been bilateral. Uh, in the last two decades, we've seen the, the spokes interconnecting more than ever before. Mm -hmm. And it's actually relatively straightforward because they're all US interoperable. So they're operating largely in English. They're operating on US uh, TDPs, te techniques, technologies and procedures, uh, and uh, protocols. So, and uh, there are situational awareness tools. There's quite a range of them actually at various classifications that uh, Korea uses, Japan uses, mm -hmm. Australia uses, the US uses that have historically been stovepiped. Uh, and they're finding that there's in, it's not that easy. I mean, it's not that hard, actually, to just flick a switch and all of a sudden you can share an incredible amount of data. Why? Because you've got the same kinds of systems. You're operating the same protocols. It's not that hard. So the, and there's more of that happening now than ever. So great question, Becky. Um, no, no, I think you've covered it really well. Thank you very much, you. Professor Blackswing and Ambassador Bergen. Thank you very much. You both look like people who like to collect military-style <laughs> coins. I bet you you have at least have, a couple hundred of I them, right? Them. So here's a Thank here's a new much. one from us, a little token of our appreciation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very Perfect. much. You. And we are going to have the book available at a 10% discount from the normal politics and pros price right out here after we're done. So please avail yourself of that. Not often you get discounts on things. And if you're interested in courses here at IWP, grab some of our staff out here. They're more than willing to provide information on courses of study, or if you just want to purchase individual courses or certificates or whatever the case may be. Otherwise, we have finished for the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.